from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you all. Good morning. I'm going to start my little watch here because we're going to buzz through about 60 slides. Y'all get ready. All right. So um, the DPLA recently launched in April. The um, site became public. Um, many of you um, may have been scheduled to go to the big launch event, and unfortunately that was the same time as the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, so um, it has been recently rescheduled, so we hope to see you guys in October there. Um, and we also recently formed a 501c3 and become an independent organization. So those are things that have transitioned from the planning phase and now we're actually into implementation. So this is one of my favorite um, photographs from the DPLA, um, is this lovely little kid um, jumping and this is from the Massachusetts Historical Society. So the DPLA is both a portal for discovery, a platform to build upon, and a strong public option. And I'm gonna walk you through what I mean by all of those. So the portal is often what people think about when they think about DPLA. Um, but I'm gonna walk through what that is and encourage you to think about more when you think about DPLA. So the portal um, obviously is the website where you can go and browse the collections that we have um, aggregated and pulled together um, that are found and you can access them in a number of ways. So you can access them through geographic data if we are pulling in data that, um, metadata that actually has geographic information. We have mapped that and you can kind of zoom in, browse, and see. So as you zoom in, you get more numbers. You can also access collections via the timeline. So if we have dates in our metadata, we can certainly find uh, collections from a certain date range. Uh, this is a search for the word, the town of Chicago or the city of Chicago or even Chicago um, uh, play, you name it. So the word Chicago. Um, and you can see on the timeline, I'm limited here to the year 1860. And so you can get down in the timeline and see um, just what data we have in that particular year. You can also do a general search. You get back Chicago the Musical. Um, you get back a number of various photographs. On the side, you can see that we have included facets, um, which is also coming in from the metadata from our partners. And you can limit by a various um, formats here, by owning institutions, by who the actual partner is that contributed. We have created exhibitions. Our partners have um, created a number of exhibitions. So they're using the Omeka open source platform and they are building um, these exhibitions. So mostly our service hubs, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, but they have built these exhibitions. Um, they're quite wonderful. We've also built a collaborative exhibition um, leaving Europe with the Europeana um, folks. This is just an example of one. There's uh, one on the National Park Service, and uh, this is an example of what you'll find. You get some rich contextual information in the exhibits that you don't necessarily get in the portal itself um, here. And full text and a lot of streaming video um, and audio, et cetera. So where do we get this stuff from? So we have both content and service hubs. So the content hubs are people who work with us on a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, they are typically larger institutions. They hold over 250,000 digital objects. So they have metadata and that resolves to digital objects for at least 250,000 objects, if not more, online. So there are people like the Smithsonian and um, Harvard and Art Store and Hattie Trust and the New York Public Library, the University of Virginia, the UIUC, a number of other partners are participating with us in a one-to-one -one relationship. Service hubs are aggregators of content. At this point, we're working largely with state and regional digital libraries. So the South Carolina Digital Library obviously aggregates content for the state of South Carolina, cultural heritage institutions in South Carolina. Mountain West is a regional digital library. They're based in Utah at the Utah Academic Consortium, but they, um, they aggregate content uh, that includes 
Nevada, as well as um, they're beginning to add content from the Arizona Memory Project as well into the Mountain West Digital Library. Um, so it, it, it represents more of a region as opposed to just one state. Uh, Digital Commonwealth is the collections in Massachusetts. Georgia is obviously the state of Georgia, Minnesota and Kentucky. They're all working with us. Um, Minnesota, for example, has 150 different partners in their state that they bring in. Um, they bring in data from, they aggregate it into a single point, and then they share that data with us. So instead of having a direct relationship with all of those 150 partners, DPLA has a direct relationship with Minnesota, who then in turn has a relationship with its 150 partners. So just as an example, so this is the Goodhue County Historical Society, small, tiny historical society in Minnesota. Um, we've all seen web pages like that, right? We've built them um, in the past. Uh, we may have even preserved them. Um, so um, you see that they, you know, they have these these great collections. Um, they're part of the Minnesota Digital Library through the Minnesota Reflections Project. So they get into DPLA through being a part of the Minnesota Reflections Project. So in effect, the Minnesota Historical Society is its own little pond, and it participates in Minnesota, which is what we're gonna call a lake, and then it gets into the ocean with other um, similar projects in DPLA. So this is one of the, the objects that they have from the Goodhue County Historical Society, which we find in the DPLA, it's a, Wonderful historic from 1885 to 1890, um, hot balloon, hot, hot air balloon. So by clicking on the metadata, the DPLA, you actually are taken to the Minnesota Digital Library where you find you know, an image that you can zoom in and, and see better. That's what the image looks like up close when you zoom in. When you come back to the DPLA, you see that we have a number of objects that are hot air balloons um, from a number of owning institutions um, that include both images and text content. So not only are we a portal, um, we are a platform to build upon. So um, we free our data. Our data is your data. Our partner's data is your data. So on our site, we have a bulk download of data. So you can download the complete repository of data that people are giving us. You can just download data from ArtStory. You can just download whatever it is that you want. You can download that data set if you want. You can download it and manipulate it. Do with it as you will. I should say a little bit more. So partners are contributing data to us under a CC0 license. So that's the metadata itself, not the actual objects, but they are contributing the metadata under a CC0 license. That's one of the reasons we're able to serve this up for reuse and allow people to um, build upon it. So where are we gonna kind of go with this data? What are some future directions with what we wanna do with it? So we wanna do some linked open data trials um, and we're gonna try to start that um, simply using URIs. Um, <laughs> this is a funny story I'm about to tell. So yesterday, um, I thought I was going to the Weston Arlington Gateway. Yes, I did. And I took a cab there. Yes, I did, with my suitcase. Um, I showed up and I went to check in and the woman said, um, we don't have a registration here for you, Ms. Gore. And I said, of course you do. You know, I'm at NDSA, you know you have this meeting here. She says, oh no, we don't. So anyway, she says, you're probably at Alexandria. So of course I was in Alexandria. And, but anyway, I built my slides to show that we were going to be at the Western Arlington Gateway. So <laughs> y'all come on with me. Um, so in geonames.org, this, this is actually the URI to the Western Arlington Gateway. Um, metadata can, can go wrong here. Um, so, but we could use this as a URI instead of typing in Weston, Arlington, or Alexandria. Um, we, could, we could use that instead of typing that in. That would minimize spelling errors, typing errors, all the things that we see in our data um, that we're aggregating. We could also potentially use name authority or subject authority files, like um, these, these files here for, um, that the Library of Congress has developed. So those subject headings would equal these URIs. So we have some partners who are getting ready to, 
do some linked data testing with us, and so we hope to take advantage um, of, of this through the DPLA portal. So our data is also interoperable. We are working very closely with our friends in Europe at the Europeana project. Um, they have developed a um, metadata model called the Europeana data model. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. And we have developed um, a very similar schema called the DPLA metadata application profile. It is built off of EDM. Um, we have a few differences, but very few, and the goal is for us to continue to work closely with Europeana to actually build one kind of generic data model that works for all of us to use. Um, that data model, can we can map whatever data you give us. If you give us Dublin Core, if you give us qualified Dublin Core mods, we have crosswalks for it. Um, we also have crosswalks for the Smithsonian and NARA who have their own data models. So we can pretty much work with you to, to map your data. Uh, we're also working with Europeana um, on rights of the actual objects. Um, we know that our write statements and our metadata, um, I think we all do, um, they're usually not, not so great. Um, we don't express things necessarily that are in the public domain. We don't necessarily say that they're in the public domain. We don't. Um, we don't give things CC0 license or CC BY license or whatever. We are often just kind of contact this repository for permission to use in our write statements. So we really want to think about what those write statements should look like and help, um, and help our partners and an extension of that hopefully help all of us think about really good write statements so that people understand what they can do with the actual objects. Because right now, that's a mystery to a lot of us. So, we have an API as well. So the, the open data has allowed people to build applications on top of um, the data. So I'm showing open pics here as an example. It's an app that has been built to kind of search different platforms. So you see that DPLA is one of the targets. Um, the New York Public Library, the Library of Congress, California Digital Library, you see other, other targets there. Um, but what you can do is enter search terms into that, use those as sources, and find, um, find what images we have. So I just did a quick search for Kentucky, and here are some of the images that are returning with DPLA as the source. Another app, Cultural Collage, that's been built um, very similar did a keyword search for the word ballet using DPLA as the source. Um, so people are beginning to build some cool apps on top of our data. Um, it's one of the things that happens when you open up your data. Another app that has been built is StackLife. So StackLife actually visualizes um, book data. And so this is some of the book data in DPLA that StackLife has visualized. You can kind of browse, there's the subject cooking American, and you can see what we potentially have in the DPLA, click from there, go back to the actual source. So this is another tool, this, this has been built by the Harvard Innovation Lab um, and is being used. Um, I'm sure many of you may have heard that we recently announced a partnership with the Hathi Trust. Um, though um, all the public domain books in the Hathi Trust are gonna be a part of the DPLA, are gonna be discoverable there. Um, and that data will also be mineable and open to the public. So we're certainly looking forward to that partnership. We're actually in the polishing phases of pulling in that data. You wouldn't believe the nuances of Mark XML, things like what's a book, you probably would. Um, <laughs> like what's a book versus what's a serial versus what's a government document. Often that's not in the Mark header. Um, and so we have to kind of figure that out if we want to have really good formats. So we're really um, working through that data and trying to make the best of it. So the other thing is we want to be um, a, a, a strong public option. So we're, we're used to, I think many of us grew up in a culture where um, we were able to walk down the street in public library and check out our books, right? And, and enjoy that and take them back and maybe share them with our neighbor. And um, we can still do that, but many of us like to have our books on our tablets these days or our whatever it is that we're carrying around. Um, and that environment has made things a little different than walking into your public library and checking out books. 
Um, we often find ourselves paying for books instead, and it's not as easy to share with your neighbor um, or to take them to a trade a book and get some money back and get yourself another book. So this is my slide from Dan Cohen, um, the executive director from, of DPLA. Um, so Dan has published a couple books, and uh, he likes to joke that, you know, uh, zombies will have taken over the planet by the time his books are in the public domain. Um, that it will be a very long time um, with our current copyright laws before um, many books kind of see the light of day um, and are open access. So we're working with um, a number of, of folks to hopefully push, push on that public option a little bit. Um, this library license concept, many of you may be familiar with the library license concept, but one of the things that um, you can do with a library license is um, grant full digital rights to libraries. So if you publish something you know, for five years, it may be embargoed, but after five years, you're granting that full rights to libraries. You can also grant full digital rights to the DPLA as part of the library license. So that's one of the things that we're trying to, to work with to get more books. Um, as Dan jokes about his book, you know, um, nobody, you know, nobody really is like clamoring, you know, there's not a whole lot of people clamoring and he would love to kind of open up his book, but he published it, you know, in a, in a way at the time that didn't allow for that. So what if people really want to publish their book in this way where it's open after a certain amount of time? Um, we need to be able to kind of work under that. Uh, projects like Ungluit, um, and, um, sorry, projects like Unglue It, we're, we're trying to work with, with folks like that um, and, and push, push forward that platform. Um, so this is a concept um, that I came up with years ago, um, working in North Carolina, having to, uh, having to drive around institutions and knowing that those people would never let us take their materials out of their building to scan them and make them available online. But in the state of North Carolina, there were over a thousand cultural heritage um, institutions. And many of them had wonderful collections that have never seen the light of day. And so I was like, we need, and it, those of you who know me, you know I have kind of a crazy sense of humor. So I said, you know, we need something that has like some awesome shocks that I can put some scanners on and I can come up in these mountains and I can scan some materials. So I joked that we needed a Scanabago and so it, it kind of stuck. Um, John Palfrey picked it up as, uh, as chair of the board of DPLA and really thinks that um, we're gonna build some of these things. So um, w when, you see a, uh, when you see a Kickstarter campaign potentially start to build Scanabagos, Bring out your wallets, contribute. <laughs> you know you want to see one in your neighborhood. So the goal would be to uh, work with small cultural heritage institutions to digitize materials and make those available. So we're building a national network, but it has local impact and global reach. I'm going to end with a case study from Morris, Minnesota, tiny little crossroads. So Morris, Minnesota, if you just do a simple Google search, has a population of about 5,300 people. So maybe a caution light. I grew up in a caution light town. Um, so maybe it has a caution light um, and, um, you know, in this, in this small area. It looks like it has a cute little main street if you look at the images. So here's the map. We do clearly have some collections in Minnesota. You zoom in, we have a few more. Um, some places we only have three or five, but we do have um, collections. There's the town of Morris, Minnesota. We have 36 items from, that have been geotagged from Morris, Minnesota. You see it is very tiny here on the map. So our goal really is to work with the folks in Morris, Minnesota and the others around to really kind of get down to that local level. This is one of our goals with the service hubs. Um, and I should say that, you know, this, this project is graciously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Knight Foundation in part with IMLS as well. And we're very grateful for that. And one of the things we are trying to do is really get out to that local level and to build that local collection. Do you, I mean, Nobody would have seen the Morris, Minnesota collections, I think, um, had we not begun to expose this broadly. 
So we really want to reach out more, and that's what we're trying to do through this service hub model. So here's some wonderful images of those um, 36 items from Morris, Minnesota. That can show up on the OpenPix app when you do a search for Morris, Minnesota. It gets really local really quick, and anybody in this room can download OpenPix and see those. So DPLA is both, we're not only a portal for discovery, but we are a platform to build upon, and we want, um, we're beginning to have a voice as a strong public option as well. And we hope you'll join us in that. I know many of you in this room um, have joined us already. We have many partners represented in this room. Um, so um, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Um, this is, these are Twitter feeds for both uh, DPLA and, and that's my crazy Twitter feed at the bottom. So um, anybody um, interested in, I think I've left time for questions in 56 slides or how many ever. So um, thanks so much and I'll be happy to take questions from the floor. Hello, thank Hi. you very much. Um, I was uh, confused a little bit about what DPLA was before today, and everything's been clarified now. Um, I'm wondering, you said you've spoken with your Piana. Mm -hmm. um, have you spoken at all with Canadiana.org? So we have been contacted by Canadiana. We've been contacted by um, FINA, a number of national digital libraries who are interested in kind of working with us. Um, so we, we really haven't, so we've only been kind of, we're a staff of four at this point, I should have said that. Um, and we're just kind of getting up and running. But our goal really is to work with, work with a number of national digital libraries, hopefully, to tackle some of these issues that, can be tackle, that need to be tackled on this global level um, instead of individually. Like when we went to build our data model, people who kind of were involved in the very beginning, we started out with kind of our own thing. And then we started talking to the folks at Europeana and realized that you know, it would kind of be crazy for us to build a US specific data model when they've already put the energy into building a, a you know, a, a fairly complex data model. So we certainly intend to work with more national digital libraries. Question here, right back in. These lights are blinding. And, and going in the other direction, do you envision that DPLA will ever be granular enough that uh, an institution or a community that isn't part of an aggregation would um, have a mechanism for their materials to go in, or will you count on the aggregators to do that level? So we've designed the model, hopefully, to count on aggregation. Um, I'm helping a number of states right now build aggregations. So um, for example, next week, I'm going to New York, where the folks in New York are trying to come together to build an aggregation. They have pockets of aggregation already, so maybe different regions in the state of New York have small pockets of aggregation, but nobody has done kind of a statewide aggregation. And so um, I've been working with a number of states to um, think about you know, what's, what's involved, what do they want to do with that, and what kind, of, what kind of resources might they need to build that aggregation. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's a really good question. Um, at this point, we are, we are believers in the, in the aggregation model. I think that is how we will sustain the project, um, is having that responsibility, you know, at kind of whether that's a state level or an organization. I've talked to several folks here about um, an, like an organization level, maybe around um, a genre like sound recordings or video or the, things like that, like organizations, regional um, library organizations. I've talked with folks in the Southeast, at the so Association of Southeast Research Libraries, a number of folks interested in maybe forming aggregations around organizations instead of maybe around geography. Geography is just really where we started. Um, if you'll remember, um, IMLS funded a number of um, kind of early startup projects that, you know, formed these kind of statewide collaboratives, um, and LSTA funds continued to support a number of them um, as, we've, as we've gone through the years. And so really we're trying to build off of existing infrastructure where possible, and where it doesn't exist, helping to um, carve the way where, where it can. Could you say a bit more about the library license concept? Um, what 
it is exactly, will it work with Creative Commons or and why is it necessary with the Creative Commons licenses? So, well, I, I think it's a little bit different in that it's giving the rights to libraries specifically. Um, I can't say tons about it because it's not my concept and I'm not really involved tons, um, but it's, it's coming out of Harvard and I think they're trying to work with a number of institutions, um, including projects like Knowledge Unlatched and others to, um, to open up this data. But I th in my mind, the difference is the specific that you can give the rights to just to libraries or just to the DPLA. There are options in there. I agree with you that Creative Commons, if people, you know, said, you know, whatever that license is that makes sense for that data, if it's CC BY immediately. I think the other option is that the, uh, there is option for an embargo for a period of time in there. Um, so there's some slight differences, but um, we are going to have a rights workshop. Um, at the um, October DPLA Fest where we're gonna try to hash some of these things out. Some folks from Library License will be there. Um, some folks from Creative Commons are gonna be there. And, and Europeana's um, kind of, Paul Keller from Europeana who is a kind of leader in, in rights to objects is also gonna be there. So we're gonna have this small kind of intense um, workshop around this to hopefully kind of help flesh out how these folks can work together. Hi, Emily. Brian Schottlander from UC San Diego. Where are you, Brian? Uh, can't see you. Um, can you unpack the phrase strong public option for me? What do you mean by that? So I think what I mean by that is um, standing for um, standing up in our community, um, having a voice in our community, um, that pushing that, that copyright um, Instead of you know Dan waiting for the zombies to come about, um, really helping to be a platform to to push that that option, um, that that analogy I made to walking into that public library and checking out that book, um, and and how increasingly in the the digital world that is becoming um, we're we're becoming further and further away from that. Um, so I think just. A, a voice, you know, hoping hoping that DPLA can have a voice in, um, you know, I, I think we'd, we'd love to think we can change copyright laws, um, but, but maybe without totally changing copyright laws, we can make some provisions to um, move forward the, the concept of openness and the concept of putting things in the public domain. Um, having open access, having people control the rights of their data. So hopefully DPLA can be a, a um, platform to, for, to help the public to do that. Uh, hi, I was hoping you could speak, um, however anecdotally or confidentially, about some of the challenges encountered in matching the metadata received from these very disparate and sometimes small organizations to the existing data model, and is that being done at the aggregator level or at the DPLA level? Sure. And Absolutely. Um, yes, As I gave a talk yesterday um, morning in Ann Arbor about collaboration, and when I got through, people said, um, Paul Conway went to the mic and he said, you make it sound so simple. I said, oh, let me not mislead you. Um, and I gave, and I said, oh, but data, data issues um, are, are huge. So absolutely, um, some of these institutions who are creating their own metadata, um, are, you know, the metadata is minimal. There, um, I'm not gonna kid you that um, when I showed you the facets down the side, these subjects, are the, is the, they're the last facet, and um, they are closed. You have to open them. <laughs> um, one of the reasons is the first subject heading is, I believe, dead. D-E-A-D, -E um, and that is because it's, there a lar there's a large portion of obituaries in there that have the, uh, that as a subject heading, and um, then there are another, um, another subject heading is gross. Um, there are a lot of, seriously, um, there are a lot of um, medical imagery in there, and um, that's an official term. So anyway, there, um, the data is, kind of is what it is. We have, um, we have run some normalization scripts. They're all up on GitHub. You can kind of see what we've done. Um, in the data, you can see the 
old data, the original data that we get versus the data that we've normalized and what we're doing with it. We're working with our partners to close that loop to begin to give them back the data that we normalize so that they can integrate it into their own local repositories. Um, a lot of that has been done at our level, but a lot of it has been done at their level too. That's why we like those one-to-one -one relationships so we can pick up the phone and call and say, you know, we need this. I'll give you one example real quick and my time is up, but South Carolina, I can, I can use this because I help create this data. Um, so in South Carolina, in the geographic field, um, people would put upstate, midlands, or the, like coastal region, all right, in the geographic field. They never put comma South Carolina. They just put upstate, midlands, coastal. So when that data comes into a global environment and it says upstate, a lot of people think upstate New York. They don't think about South Carolina having an upstate. Um, so it's, you know, we, we had to go back and say we need this data corrected at this level. Um, and this is why. And so I, we're also doing a little bit of education exchange on data um, there. And it is causing people, I think, to really think about their data on a global scale and not just kind of in their own backyard. But it is an issue. <laughs> I think my time is up. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.